How are you doing, everyone? It's Friday. It's time for another hour or so of rubbish and chat and uh, talk about crowdfunding things, but also some other news. Uh, for anyone who doesn't already know, and you, I'm sure you do because you've seen the title of today's show, uh, Free League have announced that they've got the rights to publish a new version of basically the most fundamentally important role-playing game in the whole of Sweden, uh, which came out originally in like 1982 or something like this. So we're going to talk about that. They also uh, announced that they're going to be publishing uh, the new version of Into the Odd, which I know very little about, but that will probably come up. And we've also got a couple of other things lined up. So without further ado, and with Devious Dungeons, Foreboding Forest, and The Coolest Cats, thanks for joining everyone. It's time for Kickstart Your Weekend. Let's do it. Hey, how are we doing, Hello. everyone? Hey. So we've uh, we've got a new face today, but let's uh, go through and see who we have today. Martin, thanks for coming back. It's great to see you. Uh, you're welcome. I'm happy to be here and looking forward to talking about what we've got. What we've got planned for tonight and listening to story time with your will. I'm really looking forward to that. And yeah, Yoel, thank you very much for joining us and agreeing to uh, give us a bit of a history lesson. Um, you definitely know your stuff. You've been around for at least five years. So uh, I was there in the beginning of time. <laughs> so it begins. And he'll be there so at the end. <laughs> and uh, alongside uh, anyone who's watched, by the way, our, our Mutant uh, Undergongans of Tar Targare uh, game, of which we've had. I see that face, Joel, uh, of which we've now had two episodes and we're hoping to record the third one soon. We had uh, Wilhelm von Wig, played by Joel, and his uh, robotic life partner, Robbie the Robot, <laughs> played by none other. That sounds really bad. <laughs> accurate. <laughs> played by none other than Robbie. Thank you for coming on, Robbie. Thank you. Glad to be here. Yeah. But I'm hoping that between the two of you, you can school Martin and I on the uh, the phenomenon that is Drakkar of Demona, because I had presumed that this was very similar to Dungeons and Dragons in terms of cultural impact, in terms of importance to um, to role playing in Sweden, just because D and D in you know, the US and, and the UK was obviously a very important thing and it kind of kickstarted it all. But it wasn't everywhere. You there would maybe be one or two people in the class, I guess, in the in the eighties that would have it. Um and I'm beginning to get the impression that actually in Sweden it was a bit of a different story. Yeah, it which was definitely. really surprises me. So um I think I'm right in saying that it was was it Adventuresfield that uh, published this in the early 80s based on um, the BRP system, um, sort of RuneQuest, etc. Um, but that's pretty much all I know, other than that you have a kind of legacy of it going into target games, and then the license got acquired by Riot Minds or something completely different. But yeah. I wondered, Yoel and uh, Robbie, if you could actually give us a a history of Draco Octomona and why it's so important that Free League are republishing it, even if it's not going to come to English. Secondarily, of course, there is a, an ulterior motive. I'd absolutely love it if we could get uh, a session or two of that game on the stream. I think that would be really cool. Yeah. But let's find out why. Well, let's um, start way back in history. In Sweden, in the late 70s and early 80s, uh, Pop culture for people younger than 17, 18 hardly existed. We were a starved country for pop culture. Uh, I know uh, Martin is having still great fun at mm -hmm. our Swedes obsession with Donald Duck at Christmas. <laughs> and that obsession goes back to those days because we didn't even have cartoons on TV. 
We had two TV channels. We got an hour of cartoon on Christmas Eve, and that was a Donald Duck, Duck cartoon. So that's how culturally starved the kids in the late 70s, early 80s were. Of course, by the mid 80s, um, video rental started to appear. VHS was taking over as the leading technology for videos. But previous to that, we had basically nothing. So two TV channels. Yeah, two TV channels. I mean, we had nothing three on. at this point in the UK. Huh. Maybe, maybe yeah. into four. Did, did you get any cartoons? Yeah. We didn't. Um, but only at given at certain <laughs> times of day. It was certain a dark times of day. Uh, it was a dark yeah. and dreary country with the yeah. drizzle all the time. <laughs> I mean, that's the every time you met someone, you were made sure that were they were walking in their uh, what do you call it when you say wind against you? Yeah, that'll do. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, headwind. And the, and the guy heading the other direction also had wind against him. So uh, dark, ominous times in Sweden. Boring times to be a kid, to be honest. Yeah. yeah. If, if you weren't into uh, sports and sports activities, I'm having a hard time remember how we fill the days, other than running around and playing outside. So you didn't have the pop culture. So we were starved for that one. And the story of Dark and Mourner starts with an intern at Chaosium from Sweden, basically a war gaming. Uh, nerd. That was his interest. He <clears throat> wasn't into role-playing games to start with. It was war games. And his name is Fredrik Malmberg. You have perhaps heard that name uh, connected to Cabinet Holdings, the ones that are in control of the Kungman IP at the moment, for yeah. instance. He was an intern at Chaosium, and he saw basically he saw Dungeons and Dragons and D&D and how big that was in the US. And he kind of thought, hmm, I need to get this to Sweden before anything else. I need to be first to market. And since he was working at the Chaosium as an intern, he had great relations with uh, Greg Stafford and the gang over there. So he got the license from them to use the BRP system and the BRP system in 8.1, I believe, had a pamphlet released for it called Magic World. It's not the same Magic World that they have today. They have a Magic World release in 2015. It's much updated and things. So basically, the BRP system had three or four different pamphlets for different kinds of settings. And the Magic World was the fantasy setting. So he took that, he went back to Sweden and stressed like crazy to rush it to market, to be first market, because he was convinced that any second now, someone would publish Dungeons and Dragons, but in Swedish. So they put it out there in, I think it was uh, spring or fall in 1982. And to be honest, it wasn't that good of a product, the first version of Dracula in the Morning, it didn't get the love and attention it really needed, but it sold out. It wasn't a large print run. Uh, that was the first game RPG I ever played. I never owned it because it was already sold out when I tried it. Uh, you got an image for, from me earlier, Phil? You can yes, show I that did one. indeed. So it's I presume the, it's this one here. It is. Yeah, so it th is. this is the very first version of Dungeon, uh, sorry, Dark Dad and Oc the uh -huh. released. <laughs> Freudian and slip there. Freudian the very yeah. first version of Freudian Dungeons and Dragons <laughs> worth paying attention to in Sweden. <laughs> yeah, and a lot of people actually thought that this was Dungeons and Dragons, but released yeah. in Swedish. That um, false belief still exists today. If uh, a journalist writes an article about uh, the rocker in the morning. They almost always enter, and this was a translation of Dungeons and Dragons. No, it was not. This was <laughs> BRP. My and that one... just, just to add to that, my my wife's um, brother, because they they grew up between 
um, the UK and Sweden. Um, he used to talk about playing D and D when he was in Sweden. He was like, "Oh, I got this box set, blah blah blah." And I was like, I was asking him about it, and he was explaining it, and I was like, "Can you remember anything about it?" And it was Draco de Mona. and <laughs> he was like, "He's always called it D and D, Dungeons and Dragons," um, and it's like it really, it really wasn't. You know, it's like it's not. It's a completely different game. It's not. It wasn't really aimed at you because I think when he first played it, he was like late teens. Um, so, well, anyway, I'll let I'll let you explain that. Your, but I yeah, think I just wanted to say that that very much is what people think about it that it was Dungeons and Dragons. But I think that's actually a really important point. Is um, um, Yoel or, or Robbie uh, or Martin, if you feel like it, do you want to translate what this actually says in the top right hand corner? It's, it's an says, adventure game for two to nine players uh, from 11 year and up. Yeah. So there are two things I, that I, I think are really interesting. Here. Yeah. But you didn't, did you? <laughs> Even I could have guessed it. <laughs> for anyone who doesn't know, Martin is a Brit living in Sweden. So yeah. we like to and here's the them. sneaky part from 11. Yeah. That was not the target audience. But yeah. we can get to that when we get to the second version because that's where it really kicked off. Yeah. Because when they needed to print more, they redid it and put a lot more love into it and made a it more, more appealing. Love. They, for instance, uh, if you show Mike and Moorcock's books about Elric of Minibone, no, no Swedes so will recognize it as that. They will say, oh, Drakar och Demoner. Yeah. Because they started using Michael Whelan's images ah. for the cover boxes of Drakar and Demoner. And they did it for the basically all of the 80s. And mm. yeah. So you can show that one. Oh, sorry, I got that one. Yeah, I, I'd love to. Hang on. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. I that yeah, that's the, that's the box I got personally, yeah. and uh, Me I mean, I mean, look at that cover. It's like when, when you're a boy. I don't know. I was 11 years old. It just spoke to me. I was like, oh, I gotta have this. Mm. Yeah. I mean, but I didn't I, know who Rick was. It just he just looks freaking awesome. Yeah. <laughs> and here's the big kicker when it comes to the Swedish RPG scene in the 80s and especially with products from this company, they were not sold in specialty stores. They were not sold via mail order. They had a distribution deal with a toy distributor called Jan Edman. And basically all uh, toy stores and toy departments in Sweden ordered from them. And it's when they had in their catalog, and we have this game, everybody ordered it. Every yeah. toy store. So the role-playing games like this was available everywhere you could buy a Monopoly game. Next to that, to the Monopoly was this one standing on the shelf. Yeah. And people was looking at this. This was looking cool. Remember our culture is Star Wars for pop culture? This one looked awesome. You read the back. I'm going to translate on the slide here now. The pack of orcs that's been hunting you are now... Uh, down the hill from where you and your winged mount await their attack. The orcs advance slowly, screaming and howling while swinging their scimitars in the air. You draw your sword and make yourself prepared. The place is chosen with care. Only a few of your enemies can reach you at the same time. The first orcs are within range and their, uh, their scimitars whistle through the air. But thanks to your skillfulness, you avoid the attack the orcs back down quickly and gather down the hill while they eagerly discuss how to attack you again. You raise your sword against the green sky in a victory. <laughs> and I tell you what, reading that, and this is probably something that, that we'll discuss again later, but reading that, you can immediately feel where Forbidden Lands came from, if that makes sense. Mm. Like that basically yeah. perfectly describes the feeling of every Forbidden Lands game that I've played. Yeah. And I think as well, 
the the major difference there, like you all said, is that that was just in normal toy shops. Like in the UK, I, I mean, the, you know, people, older people like Andy in the comments might be able to correct me, but um, in in the UK, you didn't get things like that in normal toy shops in the eighties. It was speciality right. shops. Um, you know, you had to go to like a games workshop or something like that, which I yeah. think was even a little bit later. Yeah. Um, so being able to kind of get it in there for kids, that's, you know, you see something like that. Nearest we got was something like Hero Quest. probably. That's exactly what I said in the green room earlier to Joel is I think it wasn't until Hero Quest and then Space Crusade came out in the 90s that we had that sort of thing happening. Um, mm -hmm. Although um, Andy says he bought Traveller from a craft shop in 1981, but... Uh, yeah, yeah, maybe. I mean, I, like I said, <laughs> Andy would know. Right, I was, I right. was too. So, yeah, you know. but but I don't think that, that that you would find anything that had quite that feeling in every single shop, like no, every exactly. bookshop. And it's the, it's the fact that it was toy shops. Yeah. Toy shops. That that's yeah. the kicker. Yeah, you know, you didn't yeah. find stuff with a cover like that mm. in to, you know in the middle of like Mary Whitehouse kind of blandifying everything yeah. in media in the uk you yeah. did not find something like that in a toy shop no so. not at all no and people had no idea what they actually bought uh, the parents had no idea exactly no. because the kids saw this and said oh that one looks cool i want that one yeah, yeah. yeah. they read it back and going, this sounds hey, like a good cool. game mm. yeah <laughs> uh what was considered an advanced game at the time was a risk. All games you basically bought for the kids had uh, the entire rule set printed in the lid, on the inside of the lid. If it didn't fit uh, in the lid, uh, basically no, they didn't produce a game. And when I get home with this, open it up, and it's like, it's by those standards, a thick book and some weird looking dice. And that's it. What the heck is this? Yeah. But it spread and it spread quickly. So, and since it was so available, hell, the suburb I live in now, uh, my grandma used to live in the suburb when I was young. They had a gift shop with uh, glass figurines and uh, shit kids didn't care about in the front <laughs> and they hated kids because kids broke things and it has yeah. small shelves in the back of the store with some toys and some games even they carried this so it was everywhere this is completely different isn't it to i think what we had in the uk in terms of the um saturation um and and I, I guess because there as you said there, there was not really much else that that would even kind of engage the imagination in that way and with the, the cover like that also probably appealing to not just children to be fair um anyone who likes fantasy fiction for example would be inclined to to pick it up and see what it's about i'm sure we didn't have fantasy fiction we had really? uh, Tol that was the it. Tolkien books. The right. Tolkien books. That was it. They yeah, I mean, if we you're stuck with the Tolkien books, culture books then you're going to want that. <laughs> yeah. So there was that category. Uh, yeah, it was very hard to find RPGs. fantasy. Yeah, sorry. It was very hard to find fantasy literature. Um, Ursula Le Guin with the... Yeah, the yeah. Wizard of Asi. Yeah. 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 Came it's... a little bit later. Yeah. yeah. In anyway, I, I think we can safely conclude that at least every every boy, I would say, of, of uh, the late 70s and all of the 80s has been in contact with a role, tabletop role-playing game in Sweden. I, I'd say everyone knows what it is, at least. Yes, yes. Everyone. And everyone. Uh, and this is not over robbing me over describing it and saying that everyone and it was like five in each class. I can't name a single boy in my class when I was 
12 that didn't have at least one RPG from every to spell. Yeah. That didn't I mean, mean all of them played it, and especially not all of them could GM it because this was a totally different thing and all didn't stick with it. But everybody in my generation, everybody tried it. I have it's a little uh, different, isn't it? Because um, in the UK, for example, I mean, Andy puts a good point that um, 85, 86, there are dedicated sections in WH Smith, which is a, a kind of a bookshop and a stationery supplies shop. You would go to WH Smith's to buy uh, stationery for your kids when they go to school. You would buy magazines and newspapers there. Uh, and mm. they'd have a small selection of books. And yeah, they'd have a little toy section. But I think what's different here is that the even though there are stores, you know, probably be one store in every city or certainly um, thereabouts where you could buy role playing games, and mm. they would be around. You know, you'd have um, quite a few different choose from Traveler, Dungeons and Dragons, whatnot, RuneQuest. There's a difference between them being available mm. and. The, the market already being saturated with the product. And I don't think and, we had that saturation in the marketplace in the UK. And I think it depends where it was as well, because, um, you know, may, maybe in some places that was the case, but in Hull, where I grew up, I, I devoured anything fancy and the WH Smiths there did not have any Dungeons and Dragons. It yeah. did not have anything like that. Like I say, the most it had was Hero Quest. Um, yeah. So I think it very much depends where you were in the country. But also, I'm quite interested, because it was so prevalent in Sweden, did you ever have an equivalent to the satanic panic in the, the US? Because hmm. that came about because it was starting to spread through kids at school. So if all the kids in Sweden knew that... Yoel has gone to hell, Satan. <laughs> yeah. oh, wrong one, sorry. <laughs> wrong the Hobbit. Hobbit. <laughs> no, that's a really good question. Robbie, what, what do you remember of this time? Uh, did you have that, that came in the 90s? As yes, far so as really. I remember. Okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, there was, uh, I don't remember the names. Joel can probably help me and point this out. But uh, there was. Uh, a journalist or a couple of journalists that went after the tabletop role playing genre. Uh, if that, did that happen maybe when Cult was released? Yeah, yes, that's exactly. C cult was the trigger. Yeah, yeah. yeah I can imagine that. Um, Before fact, that, uh, I, I don't really remember if any parent actually went after. I mean, I have a, I have a small story from when I went to school. I was fifteen. That's ninth grade in Sweden. And we had a teacher uh, who arranged uh, for a day where we all in the class, we were like 25, 30 people or something like that. This is in, in Värmland, out on the countryside, uh, where we, that's a county in Sweden, Värmland, uh, where we had a tabletop role-playing game session for, for a complete day. Yeah. And, uh, uh, and, I mean, all of my classmates got to try this, even the girls, and they, uh, they even the thoroughly. Girl. Yeah. Even the girls. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, boys, no, I boys were the, the players. Yeah. yeah, but you know, uh, and there was another book. Uh, Joel dropped out. Sorry, I've just uh, yeah, he's. He... We're looking at your screen. And, uh, door no, right. I'm back. looking for that no. book that uh, mm. they wrote basically describing the lost generation of would-be would terrorists. <laughs> we were basically being, in their opinion, the role-playing, they confuse role-play as a, when, for instance, if you're a salesman, you can do role-playing training for your sales pitch. And they confused role-playing games with learning skills. So for instance, they said we were becoming terrorists because we were learning bomb making. Yeah. And that is, yeah. that is because our character sheets says 
uh, making bombs 50%. Yeah, grenades, rocket launchers, M16s, and you know. They, they thought all these kids were like 50% of the way to being able to do it. Like looking uh, at the character, no one ever got 100%. No one uh, could ever quite get there. But if you no, and, group together, then so you too yeah, can so talk about we had right, the imaginary bombs. We had a panic, but it wasn't a satanic panic because Swedish. Yeah. Kind, it's Swedish a practicality panic. Artist. Yeah, until, percentage until cult. panic. Now, speaking yeah. of cult, by the way, um, we're hoping to have um, for October. I think we, we're going to look and see if we can get some horror role playing into uh, the Dark Orb as, as actual place. Um, so hopefully, cult. Uh, we'll do a, like a mini campaign of cult so yeah. during that, sounds, that time. Sounds awesome. Maybe some others. Yeah. Um, so keep your eyes peeled for that. Um, so that kind of wraps up uh, what the, the kind of first and second editions, I guess, which is what up until what, the, the mid to late. This is age. the second edition. Oh, sorry, this is not the second edition. This is uh, Drockard Monen Expert. Basically, they changed the system a little bit. Yeah, uh, made it a little bit more advanced with the uh, hit areas on the body and things, and they made a huge change. At least we, the players and the kids, thought so. They introduced the D twenty instead of a D hundred. No, that's actually and quite. So that's something that we should probably talk about. Is the original gaming system for Dark Ark the Warner, which is uh, uh, BRP um, Rune Quest. Yeah. So, how is that different from, uh, how it's was that not, different from Dungeons and Dragons with a D20 mm -hmm. for people who haven't played it? Uh, the difference with this one was, was basically the same system, as, but instead as the earlier one. Yeah. But instead of having a percentage die, die of 100, you had a D20. You had the same system you should roll under your skill level. But what it yep. really means is you have increments of five instead in this one. Yeah. So it, it is basically the same system with added hit point areas and different ways of handling magic. So, so was... am I right in thinking that the system is similar to RuneQuest and, and obviously Call of Cthulhu now? You have a, a, a D100, you have a, a, a skill level, which is like 83. So you roll your, your D100, your two D10s, and as long as you are below that number, then you pass the challenge, right? Yeah, exactly. And so with, with that version, they've just basically divided everything by five. Now, yes. I wouldn't be surprised if this is actually the core concept or the core basis for the, the system for Symbarum, which is also a D20 roll under. Probably is, because I think you they can were trying your ass they grew up with that. this. Yeah. I think they were probably trying to mimic that expert feel with that to get people yeah. into that game. Yeah. Um, in the Swedish side of things. Yeah, um, I mean, that's and also you care about really, right? <laughs> well, but also, I mean, you know, D twenty is synonymous with role playing in, like, yeah. you know, um, well, the rest of the world. Places, really. <laughs> no, no, I mean, in Sweden, <laughs> in Sweden as well. Really. In Sweden as well. Yeah. That's why they did it. Yeah, I heard people working for Eventspiel saying, "We did this because then we had the D twenty, like the D and uh, Dungeons and Dragons do." Yeah. yeah. Mm. So, it, it, it for me being when that one arrived in eighty five, I was eleven, and I thought it was huge. To change from a D hundred to a D twenty, I didn't even think that it was exactly the same divided by five. Five times different. Yeah, that, that's how we perceived it because now <laughs> we also had a D twenty and we're as cool as the guys in the US. I don't remember we ever spoke about this, Joel. How how old are you compared to me? I'm forty seven. <laughs> You're born in seventy four. Yeah. Yeah, exactly the same. All right. Because I don't remember it. I don't recall it like that. I mean, the expert system was, uh, they, they introduced experience, uh, the, the magic schools, uh, the hit locations, uh, 
and and yeah, strongholds basically a little bit, but that maybe was more gigant. I don't know. I don't recall. Yeah, that really. was gigant. Yeah. yeah. Or giant <laughs> in English, and uh, even to spell roughly translate to adventure games, uh, yeah. And this is Gigant, the the final uh, the, the the final version of the of the game I played anyway. Mm. Yeah. yeah, same. I mean, you just th those covers for me personally because I was a big Michael Moorcock fan. Um, absolutely blow. D and D box sets and covers completely out of the water. You oh, know, know. it's like know. if I had I a know. choice well, I... between a D and D box set and that, I'd be like, I don't care. I don't understand the language. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but at the same time, it's kind of interesting how they could basically just license that art and and it was fine because obviously uh, D and D um, doesn't matter which parent company we look at, they tend to have relatively original art. I would hesitate to mm. say at least now. Um, but, and but, yeah, but, I mean, Andy, if, if if you look down in the in the comments on Twitch, um, is just constantly surprised for more more Elric, more more cock, more more cock. But uh, <laughs> more cock. Oh, I don't think I'd oh, ever be screaming oh, now on YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, that's the thing is that. But it's kind of while on this, sense, it's like an, not a plagiarism, but it's like an, an you know, it's a a dragging of, of classic art to promote your product and let's face it there are products that do that even now in in on the current market it's fantastic marketing oh yeah totally. you know. and they were but, smart at the avenue spiel because they knew their target audience they made a game specifically for eight to 14 year olds that was their yeah. target but it says 11 on the box by by the time the average, later by the time the later versions came out, did they reduce the player count? Because that first box when it was like <laughs> two to nine players, players, players <laughs> yeah. like nine players. I mean, if that was D and D, you just wouldn't you wouldn't ever finish. Friend of the show, like, someone has to be the walk. Walk. <laughs> Friend of the show, Andy has has uh, been known to quite frequently run in-person tabletop games for like eight or nine players now oh my god i've been to that table and it was a lot of fun but the reality is you get through about a three hour scenario in that time because there's so much talking and pizza and laughter and and there are a lot of players to get through in in you know around um, so maybe it's, it's totally just the doable. difference is the difference between playing as an adult and playing as a kid because you really do get like a whole day playing as a kid whereas as an adult you're like uh maybe yeah. i can do two hours here but the kids yeah. might get up um yeah, uh... yeah, so, yeah. we had full adult, day sessions when i was a kid yeah. really yeah, and that's, really that's, that's what, what we would do at, at andy's table um i was only there the once we played traveler it was fucking brilliant honestly um probably the best science fiction role-playing game oh, it, yeah. it was really really good um yeah. that said it was an entire day and uh, i remember being absolutely knackered the next day <laughs> yeah. pizza but we good. we basically moved in into my best friend's uh, boy room and, and then we stayed there from morning until evening in fact you're still when there <laughs> yeah i'm still there <laughs> just like a, just like a skeleton there. Yeah. <laughs> like... Oh, when are totally... they coming back to finish yeah. the dungeon? <laughs> Full days from like nine in the morning to seven Honestly. in the evening. Yeah. yeah. And I can imagine as well, um, having now experienced these like lovely, long, lazy Swedish summers, that would be something that you could you could do as well when you had that really long chunk off in the summer. You could just you could just go and maybe it would be out like in a I don't know, like a stuga or something. Or you you go somewhere and you just spend that time, you know, playing nah, playing oh, games well, for ages. <laughs> Mostly we young me, it was the spring, autumn and winter. I mean, oh, summer, really? yeah. summer you did other stuff. Summer, yeah, you you want to see the sun up here. Yeah. <laughs> okay. okay. Oh, yeah, you're in the north, aren't you? Uh, yeah. Um, so, um, Jason says I had ten players in my first role playing game. As at the time, I never realised there was a player limit, and that was Golden Heroes. Golden All Heroes, right. um, that's a Simon Burley game. I haven't played that actually, but I hear good things about it. Uh, and also, says he's expecting his copy of Simbrum tomorrow. 
Yeah, yeah. Well, on the Simbarum subject, did did anyone actually play Drucker the More and Simbarum of us four guys? I don't know. Did you play Simbarum? Like Drucker the More, so uh... no. I've I've played Simbarum. I've never played. Um, uh, so we don't actually know the difference then. Hmm. <laughs> I, mean, I have. I've... Yeah. I can imagine that there's some kind of inspiration at least. Yeah. I mean, I can imagine yeah. that it's the same guys, basically. So much yeah. functional differences, but. Yeah, I mean, Simbrum is um, um, Matthias Johnson Hawker, uh, Martin Grip, and Matthias Lilia. So they uh, certainly have a background in, you know, th those older games. So before before we move on, Phil, because I know I know what kind of timeline you've got here. I wanted to ask um, both Robbie and Newell because you've spoken a lot about the system, the history, things like that, but you've not really spoken about the worlds. Because when mm. you talk about D&D, &D, a lot of people talk about Greyhawk, Forgotten Realms, um, Blackmoor, you know, yeah. if you're in there at the other yeah. time. Yeah. What was it like with, with Draco Dimona? It started out totally wild, mismatch, things didn't add up. It was random adventures set in different locations and then after a while they started started to try and create a world out of this called Ereb Altor. Ereb Altor. Mm. Ereb Altor. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, Pronunciation is important. <laughs> yeah. oh, no, and it didn't really line up that well. Some of the modules published really couldn't be fit into what they created but they did a great job with what they had so this is one of the things i actually am hoping for that freely takes into consideration from the start with their new version and that is to create a coherent world from the start yeah because so they have said that they would republish some of the older modules yeah Okay. And rework them a little bit. Yeah. So one thing, uh, one little Easter egg you just reminded me of is that the um, the corrupted land in Simbrum, to the south of the main game area, is Alberator. Ha. Uh, which is, of course, an anagram. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so so what they've actually said in their press release is quite interesting. Mm -hmm. The basic game uh, will from the start be adapted from uh oops, i've got pop-up keep coming up for me game will from the start be adapted to games and streaming online the team will work actively with inclusivity in both text and images um dark of demono is a game for everyone now it's not a game for everyone because they've said they're not like well it is heavily uh suspected they're not going to print it in any language other than Swedish, which is a shame. Learn Swedish. Yeah, I know. It's been something that I'd started and then difficult. stopped and get back to it. Yeah, but I don't speak German either. So. I've done it all on my life. Yeah. yeah, I mean, you managed to pick it up as a kid, so it must be easy, right? <laughs> no, we'll just put every while... single page into Google Translate. It'll be fine. Yeah, um, but I, I wanted to chip in also because uh, the, the the Fria Ligan and, and um, Svavel Winter and uh, Erik Granström with the Trakorian, I, I think this guy needs to be mentioned because he created yeah. the one of the the best adventure module I've ever played, and, and that's Svavel Winter and the and the series. It's uh, it's really great, and he's uh, also the world. Designer, you say that in English, don't you? The world designer, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, of of uh, Forbidden Lands. Yes. Yeah. And we we forgot to mention how important the art of the Dark Arrow is. Mm, I mean, Nils Gullikson and the art inside. I mean, pff, that's art porn, basically. Yeah, that, For a boy, that, that, eleven year old. That, that, so we that mentioned kind of like there. line work in there is amazing. Yeah. So we we talked that. about the yeah. Um, yeah. the covers of Drug of the Mono and how they are basically ripped from Moorcock books. Yeah. Let's talk about Nils Gullikson and, and what happened with his art. So he came into Evan I'm not going to say he came in late, but he wasn't there from the start. 
basically the Book of Beasts monsterboken for Drakar and Demoner. Book of Monsters. Yeah. Yes, uh, that was his big uh, showcase where he created got a lot of art. What he got to shine. Yeah, yeah, he got to shine and have spaces to publish his art. So, and from there on, he was uh, Eventus Builds head illustrator, at least for us kids that bought the products. He was the one. And when Friedrich published the art book of his works, as a stretch goal, they had, if we reach this level, we will create a role-playing game based on the artwork. And that game became Sverdet Song, which is Forbidden Lands in English. I actually prefer Sverdet Song. I think it's a, a much more... Sverdet Song. Uh, yeah. Song of the Sword. Exactly. Mm. Which it's much more is, evocative, isn't it? Yeah. Especially yeah. in Forbidden Lands. For me, that title doesn't really ring true because no one really calls it the Forbidden Lands. They call it the no, Raven it got, Lands. It's the people yeah. from the south that call it that, isn't it? It's the Raven yeah, Lands. It is. It's, yeah. It's, yeah, I mean, it's an okay it's title. Bad. It, yeah, it works as a title, but it's not really, it doesn't tell you what it needs to tell you. Mm. No. Right. But I got into uh, the Kickstarter. I, I figured uh, how that worked and how. We, uh, Thanks to the, the art book of Nils Gullikson, that's how I started to kickstart stuff. Yeah. I mean, that's how important he were to me. It's like, oh, he's making an art book. Maybe it puts something new in there. Maybe something interesting. Awesome. I'm backing this. And then tabletop RPG. And oh, cool. I got the rules. And hmm, I need to look at that. And here, I'm back again. <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't yeah. play for, I don't know, I stopped playing when I hit the university, beer, babes, and, you know, uh, and, then, <laughs> and then I got back into it. It's like, yeah, it drew me back in again, Nils Gullikson and the art. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And I don't think you're alone in this. In the beer and babes. Kind of. <laughs> so in, in the having a, one of the things has been, Honestly, we played as kids, having entire days to play. And our, at least for me, the mindset was that that was the only way to play RPGs. Like having a few hours to play RPGs, that didn't serve a point. So it was a mindset that it could be done shorter. And this is just like three, four years ago for me yeah. that I started having four-hour sessions in the, after work and saying, we can play like this. Yeah. Yeah. And so we have two play, we have it? two hour sessions now. That's what I was gonna say. And Especially when playing online. I think two hours is kind of it works. I was really yeah. skeptical. In fact it was yeah. on the Effect uh podcast where they have a, a YouTube channel um where I first played a game in two hour sessions every week and I thought this is gonna just suck. And it doesn't actually because I think uh, about three hours sat at a desk it actually becomes quite difficult to maintain attention without a break you could probably do a couple of two hour sessions with a sh short break in the middle like half hour yeah. break or something which is going to be similar to what happens when you play in person mm -hmm. actually a four hour session is is probably three hours of of gameplay and, and half hour of just talking crap in the middle when you get distracted but i think when you're playing online it becomes a much more intense thing and uh, it's quite a lot harder to keep your attention. And the two hour session, I think is that, it's like watching a movie, you know, that's kind of your limit. And after that, you start to get uncomfortable. Yeah, that, I mean, you get that screen tiredness, don't you? That's why you're supposed yeah. to take a break from your screen, you know, when you're working, yeah. Yeah. staring at it. So makes sense. Yeah. And if you spend your entire working day on Zoom or something anyway, then it's kind of just like being at work, you know? <laughs> yeah. Um, Oh, uh, since I only have uh, another 15 minutes before I had other obligations, I wanted to move on a little bit with the uh, uh, Drucker of the Morning. And that is by saying that the hype for the Swedish RPGs of the 80s started to die down in the 90s. By the That's late when 90s. When your babes came. Yeah, <laughs> basically. <laughs> The eight to fourteen year olds 
grew older, then they released Cult, trying to capture them again when they were 14. Yeah, um, although you couldn't buy it until you were 18 in the UK. That's right. the UK. We, yeah. we, these are just recommendations and no store cared about it. Yeah. And they put, I think they put 18 on Cult, and they did that Basically, by the same reason they say 11 for Drakar och Demoner. Buy it if you're younger, you're going to be cool. Yeah. Yeah. So it, they have been very good at marketing all throughout Eventyrspel's um, existence. What they did was run with the market a little bit ahead of it. So, for instance, Mutant that they created... Uh, Gunilla Jonsson and Mikael Petersen created Mutant in 84. Yeah. Same persons that created Kult. Eventyrspel basically used the Mutant label later on to put on everything that was the current trend, futuristic. So it started with this post-apocalyptic weird world with talking animals. Then all of a sudden we had a cyberpunk version then we had a space version, and then we had a version that, that tried to eat a bit of uh, Games Workshop's cake of Warhammer 40k with Mutant Chronicles. Yeah. Mm. I no, wonder I how much that. Newton was um, inspired, inspired, maybe not at all, by um, Gamma World. Very Gamma much. World came, very yeah, much. Uh, both, those, both. those two are very similar to me. Yeah. They... We're very inspired by Gamma World, according to the creators themselves. Hmm. And then they added typically Swedish mentalities and things to it. So it's a very Swedish line to start with. Ducks. I played a collect uh, the ducks a card were game. We're not in the... mutant. <laughs> I played no, a collect card be. game in the, in the 90s uh, called <laughs> Doom Trooper. And uh, it's only in the last six months when I just had a bit of nostalgia and started thinking about the fact that I'd given all these cards to a friend because I would stopped playing it really. And mm. I looked on eBay and you, you can still get it. It's not overly expensive considering the prices of some other nineties card games. And it's actually is a mutant Chronicles product. And I just, I, you know, never put two and two together because I wasn't really doing role playing much at that point. And what I was playing was, as I said before, Vampire the Masquerade which only played a little bit. And, and in fact, for me, the story was different. I started role-playing properly when I went to university. Same. And, and my beer and so bakes beer and when bakes? I got home from okay. university. Oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> just, <laughs> I mean, I had, know, just, you know, in the downtime. <laughs> yeah. You know, you've got to kind of recover a little bit, right? No. There, was, there, was, there was quite a lot of downtime. Well, there, were, there was quite a lot of beer and babes in the, in the role-playing society, to be fair. <laughs> Honestly, we, we had a very uh, diverse role playing society. Uh, in the university, that, sorry, that's great. Sorry. That's good. Uh, honestly, uh, they they um, came out with a book, uh, Evan to Spiel or something like that, uh, yeah. where they sort of summed up the history of Swedish. Uh, this is nostalgic, nostalgic, nostalgic book. Yeah. Um, and I bought it in a in a normal bookstore in Stockholm. And uh, and I asked a fairly young woman, maybe in her twenties. I was forty plus. Uh, it's like, do you have this book? I, I don't. I can't find it. And she told me, Yeah, I know where it is. And and she walked me to it. And she told me she's a role player. And I was like, Wow. <laughs> <laughs> They do exist. <laughs> it has developed. <laughs> Women play these days. Right. <laughs> and then you rage quit and you never played again. <laughs> mm. Best oh. best groups ever. I mean, if you listen to actual play pods and stuff like that, it's yeah. a good dynamic. It's a great, yeah, I'm really happy in this uh, development. Yeah. Definitely. Totally. The more Definitely. diverse the players, the better. Yeah, says absolutely. says a man on a stream with like four um, <laughs> four, white guys. Yeah, four, four, four white guys in our forties. <laughs> <laughs> I think the more diverse, that, the better. Oh crap! That was the weakness with the distribution model they had. Yeah. Because when you're in middle school, 
guys and girls don't play with the same things. At mm -hmm. least not in the 80s. So if the guys wanted the role playing games, the girls so did now. <laughs> they, they look funny, yo. They yeah, look but this is what it was in the 80s. <laughs> Today, my son has got a pink chapet uh, of starting English. Pole horse? I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. yeah. With a unicorn horn. He wanted a pink one. Sure. Yeah. Whatever. Yeah. yeah. So That's cool. cool. That's cool, but man. We tried to get the girls to play. Didn't work. Yeah. Back in middle school. And then you but got to your twenties and it still didn't work. But it works now. I have girls <laughs> in my study group that I play yeah. with uh, bi weekly. But yeah. it, it, if we go to the one. Kickstarter now of Drucker the Bonner, where Free League then is republishing uh, yeah. Drucker the Bonner, they are using the BRP system. Yeah, so they've they acquired the rights doing... from, from Riot Minds, haven't they? So they yeah. acquired the license, which probably would have been quite expensive as well. So it's a ballsy move. I'm really pleased that Tomas has decided to do it because I, by all accounts... You know, I think they have a plan. It's not that ballsy. Oh, definitely. They have a very good plan. I, yeah. I, I think Riot Minds... I don't think Riot Minds made any friends no. with their version. No, they didn't. No. They no. didn't at all. No. At they all. created enemies with it. I mean, yeah. I don't think it's that ballsy when you're basically like, hey, they took a real risk with their version. We're just going to go back to basics. Yeah. <laughs> I don't yeah, actually true. think that's that ballsy. I think that's like, yeah, okay, we're just going to produce the game that everyone wants then. All right. But, <laughs> well, let's see what they do. I mean, the, I'm sure they'll the tell me Yeah, go on, you are. There's been some backlash about this in the RPG community in Sweden. And the backlash has basically been, but why? We don't need it because we have this now. You see yeah. this cover? Mm. It's the same cover as the Gigant box. And basically can we, can, this... Can we compare? Yo, do you want to hold that to your right and I'll just... Uh... Yeah. It's exactly the same. Only yeah. mirrored. Mirrored, yeah. So what people are saying is that this... Uh, yeah, you said Riot Mind screwed up the release of Drucker and the Warner and uh, the IP, and they did. Mm. This is what the role playing community wanted. They have yeah. created a more modern version of Drucker and the Warner. So I know a lot of people are using this to play the old modules because they think this system works even better than yeah. the old Drucker and the Warner for Drucker and the Warner stuff. So why would Freely do this? Because they That's know they that... can make money off the name. <laughs> no, these well, guys won't really buy it. Yeah, I mean this, this is, is that, that product is, is Helmgast, right? As well. So. Yeah, this is Helmgast. We are not the customers for this product. It's the ogres. <laughs> yeah, we the ones that are in the RPG community now are playing games. We're not customers for the free leagues, the rocker, and the morning. So you're not going to back it then, you will? I will because I, <laughs> I'm Hell, a even I might back it. <laughs> Yeah, but we are comparatively few. But imagine this as Robbie said, we are both of us are 47. If you add 10 years, to people that are 10 years older than us and 10 years younger than us, that's quite a large population. Mm. Which age are their kids now? Mm. Eight to 14. Mm. So this is a product aimed at parents that have forgotten all about RPGs. But when they go into a bookstore or see an ad, might be using the Michael Whelan cover. I would not be surprised if they do. And they see Drakar och Demoner. They read the back label and it reminds them of their childhood and how fun they had with it and when they were 12. They will buy it for their kids. That's 12 yeah. today. They haven't touched an RPG since the late 80s, but they will buy this one. And they have also said that they will re-release some of the classic modules. Hmm, wonder why. They will stand there right beside the game with the same name that we remember the Daskogen and so forth. Don't kill the Minotaur! It's perfect Christmas <laughs> present, isn't it? It is. 
they are redoing exactly the same thing that they did in the toy stores. People yeah. will buy it because it looks cool without yeah. thinking anymore. Nostalgia, I buy it. And this might even bring in the old school players. Those parents that buy it, buy it for the kids, they maybe play with the kids. Then they start exploring well, hmm, what else is out there. And they find yeah. uh, song or Forbidden Lands and so forth. And all of a sudden, you have a huge number of customers. Yeah. And this is a customer base that isn't open on the market today. Yeah, because let's face it, if you publish it an RPG, it's the same bloody morals that's going to buy. It's going to be me. It's going to be you, Martin. It's going to be you, Phil. Yeah, it's true. We are, and Robbie, you're buying way too much as well. I know that. So. <laughs> <laughs> we, are, we, we, we are a finite number of persons buying yeah. all the products. But you're right. We're already in the hobby. We're already consuming that. And we're, we're a captive market. Mm. But particularly in Sweden, and probably why this won't be translated is because in Sweden you have a a target market of anyone who went to school in the 1980s that has no. children or grandchildren. No. Um, and if those yeah, children that, and that's something that doesn't 14. exist here. No. And I mean, what are you, you going to do? Are you going to release a game called... Um, Dragons and demons, demons in English. Yeah, it's not going to work, is it? I mean, <laughs> you, you're going to have a world of pain if you do. Uh, yeah. It didn't um, work to release Dungeons and Dragons in Sweden. You know they did. Hmm. Yeah. Um, but I think the uh, way to do it would be to actually release it as Drag of and Mono and just have people going, oh, Draka Och Daemona. Yeah, oh my <laughs> God. Draka Och Daemona. Oh, it looks like a... <laughs> Looks like Dungeons and Dragons, doesn't it? <laughs> so I think, yeah, I'm going to call it Drakkar Och Demon and now. <laughs> <laughs> so okay. Beautiful. I think they have yeah. a huge potential audience for this. Yeah. That is not the consumers of RPG products today. Goblins and Grottos. So <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean... yeah. And and I think that's a really good a good place to. To end the conversation yeah. about a drug optimum. So, to recap, hugely, hugely uh, culturally important game. Freely Gun have acquired the license from Riot Minds to reproduce it in a new edition. Doesn't sound like they're going to change too much, but they're going to freshen it all up. Presume it's going to hit Kickstarter. Uh, I haven't. Check that. Don't Maybe it'll so. just go straight think, to pre-order. I don't think. Yeah, I don't think it will be Kickstarter. I think it will go straight to pre-order. And not only that, I think they are working on a bookstore deal. Or well, I, I can a imagine deal. they would probably. We, they probably already had this in motion for a couple of years, and maybe they're going to yes. aim for Christmas. I think that would be the, the wise thing to do, wouldn't it? You know, announce it, and then two months later have it available for people to pre-order. Um, if not this year, then then maybe the next. Um, we have already yeah. seen some RPGs in Swedish in um, one of the biggest bookstore chains called Academy Bookhandel. Mm -hmm. That is based on kids' books uh, called uh, Röda Masken. Yeah. I think it's Röda Masken. It's about it. a, yeah, a, small, <laughs> a kid superhero. All right. And they actually... Uh, brought in the RPG in all the bookstores. It's sold out now. Yeah. And that RPG is basically just a spin-off of the books. It's not going to have the same pull as this. So I think we, this is my speculation. I guess we will see this product in bookstores, maybe even toy stores. Yeah, physically in stores, and not that you need to go and search for it. You will find it without looking. It'll and it'll that's be there. How you find the customers. It'll be there, staring at you the moment you go looking for a book or a toy for mm. for your son, your yes. daughter. At Be Christmas because for the ones whatever. like us that goes to Kickstarter, we are not the target audience. Yeah, I think you're probably quite right, and it will be really interesting to 
find out what happens over over coming months. Um, Free League have also announced that they've got the rights to publish, or they're working uh, to publish the new edition of Into the Odd, which uh, I believe is like a forty-page like mini RPG. Um, we'll talk about that in a, in a little bit more detail, mm. uh, and uh, Electric Basket Land as well. But for now, um, Yoel, I know you are short on time. Really, really appreciative that, that you jumped on to give us that whistle stop tour of RPG in Sweden. And um, we are going to uh, now move on to the second segment, which is where we're going to talk about some of the uh, the crowdfunding games that are currently happening. And we've only got a couple to talk about. Yeah, mm. so I believe in you guys. And to be honest, this was only about Drakar och Demoner. This is the true. rest of the games we didn't cover. This is true. We, we will come back. So please, uh, everyone that's watching, if you enjoyed the uh, the spotlight session we had on, on Draco of the Morning and you'd like us to cover another game in this format, maybe in a month or so, um, let us know. Like the you know, like the show, let us know in the comments if there are any particular games over the last 20 years, 30 years that you'd really like us to cover. And let's see if we can uh, do another spotlight in you know, in, in a few weeks. You're well. Good to see you. Good to see you guys. You well. Take care. Good to see you all. Right. Bye. Bye. All right, now he's gone. We can talk about him. Yeah, we can <laughs> talk about him. <laughs> oh, that was so, so fun, so interesting. And yeah, I mean, Joel is right. There are so many other games uh, that have not made it into the English language that are fascinating. I'd love to know more about and maybe get some of those on the show as well. Yeah, all, I mean, mean yeah. I that Svavel Vinter that you were talking about. Yes. Um, my God, I have tried to read that book so many times. Have you seen <laughs> my, my, Swedish, my Swedish just does I not mean, cut it. At you all. know, there's, there's so an English language jargon. quick start for it. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I'm, no, I'm the, no, no, the, no, the Martin, novel. Martin. Yeah. Oh, the novel, not the, the problem yeah. game. I, I mean, it sparked a, a book novel series of four books, and they're mm. massive. I think they're like 500, 600 pages or something like that. Yeah, and the text is so small as well. I like. Yeah. I opened it yeah. and I was like, oh. But honestly, Martin, I mean, this is difficult for me as a Swede to read. I, I didn't know that you could actually mangle the Swedish language this way. <laughs> <laughs> I have a five-year plan, and that plan yeah. is to get to page 10. Uh, <laughs> so <laughs> are you just going to tear each page out after you've read it yeah i mean there's it. a lot of i mean if you if you just consider fantasy books in english as well how much kind of jargon language they use now yeah. take that and increase it by like tenfold i mean yeah. i like i was reading the f first page and i was just like i got no idea what's going on here like i know that word is and and yeah. that word is <laughs> But you what know. about the others? Okay, you know, I have this, this problem. This with, and that. Uh, <laughs> it's a game which I have behind me, actually, Shadows of Esteran. Um, um, I have a similar problem. I mean, it's beautiful. The way it's written is absolutely wonderful. But it's got such a large glossary of unique terms for the world, the mm. types of people and the lands and, you know, um, the different races that exist. Yeah. Cultural races, not as in, um, yeah. you know, species um mm. that i find it really hard and it's written in a very romantic i mean it's, it's a translation from french so the, the language is very kind of romantic and, and uh, ethereal in places and it's also the first book is written in a lot of letters written in first person mm -hmm. and i mean it's really compelling but you you read 100 pages of it and you're like well that was really nice but i've got no idea what <laughs> <laughs> what just happened <laughs> I mean, Sw Swedish is very good at creating these kind of compound words as well where they kind yeah. of like squish words together so when you're reading a fantasy novel and he takes like three <laughs> Swedish words that are already quite like advanced terminology and just goes yeah, yeah I'll just I'll take a couple of letters out and squish them together they'll know what I mean <laughs> and I'm like no idea mate what are you going on about what I mean some of them are uh, I think the I think the English word is archaic do you say mm. that? How do you pronounce that anyway? Exactly yeah, like that. that was okay. Perfect. Yeah. Stop showing I mean, off. I mean, oh, sorry. <laughs> anyway, uh, you can show me I, a I mean, mark now for our terrible English. 
Some of them are really, really old. You have to sort of figure yeah. out what they mean. Even it's like I, I had no clue that you could write this way, and 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 it's yeah. actually the the author of of the adventure module, the RPG adventure module, Eric Nordstrom, that wrote the the novels himself. Yeah. So uh, and it, I think it was a success amongst people on on the Swedish. Um, market in a way that played these modules and wanted to see yeah. his view of, of this yeah, yeah. okay before, before we, we talk get about too off tangent let's talk i want to say from crowdfunding yeah go on, go on what i want to say usually you start with like have you what received you anything in the post this week martin have you received anything in the post this week you know i have but not on kickstarter i think oh. you should get your uh i think you should get your uh red bubble Link going across the bottom because I'm going to have to type it in. Hey, <laughs> the dark orb. That's a really nice logo. I'd love to say that I'm wearing the it same is. thing, but I've got a shockwave T-shirt on. <laughs> <laughs> at least, at least one of us is representing. That was a surprise. Thank you, Martin. That's all right. <laughs> Your boobs are top secret. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Or, I mean, yeah. Yeah, I'm no, not, I've I've not received any Kickstarters stuff. this week, but I did get this in the post. So. Oh, thank you for your support. Mm -hmm. That's all right. A really nice surprise, um, and it also explains why your why your camera would look like you know. <laughs> I was like this. You could grow it. Can you can you lower a bit? And I was like, no, <laughs> no, no, I can't. I'm not going to do that. <laughs> and then he you said in, in the private chat, it's like I've got a surprise down low. <laughs> But nothing <laughs> creepy. Yeah, to be honest. <laughs> uh, yes. It's so, right. if you would like some dark orb merchandise, uh, bearing in mind that at this point in time, at least we don't do a patron. Um, if you'd like to support, help support the show, it'd be really appreciated. We're on Redbubble. Just look for the dark orb. Uh, alternatively, the link is in the show notes below. I'm not going to bother flashing it up on the screen because you can't click on that. Um, but yeah, down there, not on Robbie's head. Underneath uh, Robbie. <laughs> kind of where Robbie. Robbie's I'm, crotch I'm helping. would be. I'm helping. <laughs> <laughs> where way. Robbie's creepy secret is. Yeah. Uh... <laughs> creepy top secret. This quickly escalated. <laughs> <laughs> De-escalated. Let's talk about crowdfunding games. Um, actually, I'll be completely honest. I mean, Andy said something earlier on. Um, uh, let me see if I can find it. It was a little while ago now. Um, Phil says that looks cool about everything on Kickstarter. You know that's happening less and less right now. Um, there hasn't been a lot that's really kind of caught my eye. So there are two things that, are, that have that we should talk about. And there's a couple of things that kind of haven't, but I can see that they're really popular. Um, the first one is one that um, actually, Martin, you mentioned before we was made it, a joke was it about. Last week? Yes, we made a joke about all the tables in this book and how that probably means that this is not without number. Mm -hmm. This would be, if I can get my share to work. Starts without number. Yeah. So first of all, I'll say that I've downloaded and I started reading. Actually, there's a free edition of Stars Without Number that you can get from Drive Through RPG. Don't know how that differs from the non-free edition. Um, I do. This is why I was going to say, you know, <laughs> but Martin <laughs> might. However, what I was going to say is that I mean, it it, it does look pretty good. Uh, at first glance, in terms of, I'm just going to zoom this in a little bit. Um, it feels like a kind of OSR game in some ways. Um, it is very OSR. Yeah, well, the yeah. core stats are really simple. The system yeah. is really simple. So, so that makes me want to ask, and this is without um, any real prejudice. Why would I spend? $80 for an offset print of this book. Tell me about Stars Without Number. Okay. And tell me first about the game in, in general and why you love it. Well, uh, and then for we can stars, come back and actually talk about 
what it you know what the value is there for starters i would say you're not going to spend eighty dollars because that's the American version. You're going to spend a hundred and something dollars because that's the international yeah, version. Um, absolutely. Secondly, and I know you said you wanted me to try and sell it to you on the stream, Phil, but I, I'm honestly going to say you don't have to spend that, okay? Because it's th there's a free version, like you said, on there. You get two hundred and sixty odd pages f with that no free even pages. version. Um, I, I mean, it, it's, it's one of those ones. I, I honestly think that this is a Kickstarter that if you really like Kevin Crawford's stuff, um, it's worth backing for a book that is going to last because it's Smith's own, um, you know, it's hard bound like the, um, I've got, I've got his worlds. Yeah. I've got his worlds without number and. Um, that's, I mean, that's the a fantasy. thick book. Uh, it, that is. It's 400 pages. Um, yeah. uh, I think Stars Without Number Revised comes in at about 300 and, 360, something like that. So it's a little bit yeah. smaller. But you need something that's going to be robust. And I it's a melee personally, weapon. yeah, it, it needs to last when you smack people with it. <laughs> I personally don't Strength like roll. the POD. <laughs> Um, I'm the same. drive through yeah. RPG POD w with a book this size because the yeah. spines just die. Yeah. And they, you get they... the premium edition, but if you get a premium edition, like I've been looking at the premium edition of Vampire mm. Dark Ages, I think it was, for a long time, and you're looking at 80 quid. Well, the premium edition of this on drive through is like uh, around 90 to $100. Yeah. So it just feels crazy. You know, if you no. go, if you're willing to pay that for twenty dollars extra, you'll get one that will actually last. And I mean, this one, I was, I was playing around with it earlier today. The book. Um, <laughs> Here we go. Hang on. <laughs> All right. Who's creepy um, now? <laughs> yeah. Um, well, you know, I knew what that was coming guy. next from Phil, um, <laughs> and it really does. I mean, it really does. This this is one of the problems with ones that aren't Smith's own. They don't lie flat like that without yeah. really stressing the um, the, the spine. spine. Yeah. And the, yeah. the spine on this, it just snaps back. You don't get that nasty kind of crack that you get with some spines when you know if you keep doing it, the book is just going to fall apart. Yeah, like um, pretty much every role-playing game. Yeah, it, it, it's, built, so you... it's built to last, really. So um, tell me about the game itself. Okay, so the game itself, um, like you say, it is OSR. Um, it's got the standard six stats. You've got Strength, Dex, Con, Int, Wiz, Charisma. Um, you're looking to roll high rather than lo roll low. So some OSR games take that rather than the other way. Um, you've got... Um, you've you got kind of like... A modifier. So we, um, we played, for example, DFC, uh, DCC uh, mm -hmm. a couple of weeks back. Which yeah. is obviously another OSR game. Do, do you have a modifier based on your? You on do, your but it's not a, it's not as swingy as standard D and D. It's not as the low the low ones aren't as as much of a minus as they are in standard right. D and D, and the higher ones aren't as much of a plus. So even if you roll a bad stat at the beginning, you're not you your um your you're actions are going to speak louder yeah. than your stats really. I think no, that's probably a good thing. It means that yeah. you don't end up just hating your character if you've randomly rolled it. Yeah, I, and I think when you um, you have a standard array, but you can also roll you, you uh, stats. And what it says in when you roll, if you roll your stats randomly, you can choose any stat you've rolled and swap it for a fourteen, which hmm. is actually quite a fourteen is pretty good in in that system. So it allows you to kind of get rid of your lowest or in fact give yourself keep a low one and give yourself two two nice high stats. Mm -hmm. Um so it's fairly stand honestly Kevin Crawford books I don't buy them for the for the system and I don't buy them for the setting which sounds weird. I buy them I for that. the GM tools. Um right. it is cram packed full with gm tips tricks random roll tables um it has everything in there you could want for the setting that he's trying to create with worlds without number it's fantasy so you will get roll tables for um 
like uh like a castle kind of settlement and then you'll be yeah. rolling on court politics factions within that and you can do it all completely randomly or you can choose from it but it means that at the table if the players suddenly go oh well this other settlement on the other side of the continent because they're embroiled in something what is their court like you haven't thought of it bam 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 you've rolled up a couple of tables you got something you want to play around with and you just say yeah it's like this you know yeah. I, You've already it, sold it to me. It's like, where can I get yeah, this? I, I mean, it's <laughs> it, honestly, it's it's perfect for GMs that want to create a, a world with depth, but don't necessarily want to have it an all-consuming thing in their life. So he he calls in in his books he calls them for the work for the the working GM. Um, and I think that's kind of got like two two meanings. It's for people that want to work on their setting, but it's also for people that have a life outside of role playing. Mm, um, yeah. And you know, he, he's got this kind of the, this golden rule, um, which is um, it's kind of a two part rule. It's am I having fun building this? If yes, carry on. <laughs> if maybe, ask a sec second question: Am I going to need this for the next play session? And it's very yeah. much that's that's how his books are structured. It's like four people that want to create a setting, but four people that are interested in creating a world that is interesting for the players. It's it's this sandbox to play in. Oh, you mm. want to go over there now? Oh, that's really cool. And he, he recommends, you know, at the end of every session, you say to your players, what, what do you think you might want to do next session? So that you're a bit guided as to what you're going to roll up. So with, with Stars Without Number, um, what you're really looking at is um, kind of galaxy creation, you know, local yeah. systems, the, the factions within the systems, and then you build out from there. And pretty much if you take one of his books and you work through it in order, at the end of it, you're going to have like this kind of galaxy built that you can just play in. Um, You've got the foundation. Yeah, you guys exactly. Catch that one, the foundation. Oh. Yes, nice. <laughs> Isaac Asimov one there. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, yeah he, and he, he's very much, um, you know, take as much as you want. Um, he's very open and honest in his books that it's not for. Um, it stars without number now on Kickstarter. Ah, thank you. Worlds without number is the is the old one, which he still actually got some copies left in his shop. Quite, okay. quite expensive shipping. <laughs> yeah, there, there um, is um, an option for getting both books if you're in the US, which I think is a shame. Yeah. He does still have some mm. copies available on his web store, which you can buy from abroad. Mm. Um, and you can, Worlds Without Number, you can go on um, Drive Through RPG and you can download the first 300 odd pages for free. All right. He basically he splits yeah. his book. He releases two versions of his books: the standard version, which has the base game, the setting, a little bit of rules, and then at the end he always puts in a little bit extra for people. So, for instance, with um, with Stars Without Number, he has like all of the base game, which is um, let me just go through this really quickly. Um, he's got sector creation um system creation psionics character creation starships history of space in his setting a bestiary factions which are always really good um and then if you get the deluxe version then you've got transhuman tech true ais mechs rules for heroic pcs because of a lot of his systems are quite grim dark he'll die pretty easily um society creation and like space magic if you want to make it more science fantasy so but both of those books are completely compatible worlds without number stars without number same base system if you want to do um fantasy in space spell jammer you can do it yeah with mm. both of those books um so what to sum up what i would say is you don't have to back this. But if you're it, a collector, you might want to. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a kind of book that I like. I would want to last. I don't yeah. want it to fall apart after a few uses and the spine to break. And, and it's because will... of those tools, isn't it? So if, yeah. if, you, if you like having tools to make your job as a GM easier, mm -hmm. um, 
there's a collection of them all available within the same book tailored towards science fiction in this case but not exclusively for that and i would presume therefore that worlds without number is kind of the same thing more tailored towards fantasy setting it's very um it's it's kind of science fantasy so it's quite gene okay. wolf um it's like it's like a society that maybe had technology in the past and yeah. now it's turned to magic but it still has that kind of stuff but yeah. both of that them would probably very be much more interlinked. my bag these days I, mm. I always thought i'd be deeply deeply into science fiction role-playing games because i love science fiction as a genre actually this... i'm more towards fantasy and uh, post-apocalyptic these days is um, is this uh, art inside or what yeah. what about the art artwork inside? i mean the um if you want to give me an if you want an example of what his fantasy uh, the people also i would say um he he's one man right synomine publishing which is his publishing company is him in the writing mm. credits there's him there's no one else you know he doesn't as far as i can see he doesn't employ um you know it's written by kevin crawford and then he's got people listed that created the artwork so he's his mm. own editor as well and i mean i think this is where you look at kickstarter and you think what where is the value here and the value is that if you're paying someone that's creating something like this themselves um you're paying him to still be able to do it mm. because, because this you know this is what he does this is how he makes his money and if you're wanting to support someone who makes his livelihood through this then sometimes you have to pay a little bit more than you would from a company such as free league and or mm. any of the other larger yeah. companies that you're quite happy to pay a third of the price Mm. So anyway, the artwork is um, the artwork is. I I mean I love the artwork in his books. Um, no. It's um, it's evocative. There's not a massive amount of it. It's very wordy. Um, <laughs> you know, I mean that's like a typical spread. Roll tables, yeah. lots of words. Um, let's try and find something inside. Well, I'll tell you what, I've got a copy of the free edition here. Yeah, yeah, so you can just... probably show it a bit better than me. Mm -hmm. And this is worlds without number rather than. And what he has said is, there's not going to the the version that's on Drive Through RPG right now. There's not going to be a change to that other than maybe typos, no. um, or a bit of errata. So if you see the artwork on the free version, that's what you're gonna get in this version. Mm. So. Yeah. Let me see if I can just share. Here we the go. The page page count difference is. 261 pages in the free version and 324 pages in the deluxe version. All right. Um, so there's like 60 this. extra pages. There we go. That... Right. So I'm just going to scroll through this. Obviously, we can't see too much of it on this shape screen. I'm struggling with only having one monitor up at the moment. So bear with me. So this, yeah, 230 pages. Oh, that's but cool. Yeah. It is really pretty. I mean, for a book written by one person, I was looking at this, I was comparing it to like, um, I, I had to hand the cipher system, revised, yeah. which is a tiny bit bigger, um, roughly the same size. You know, they've got five writers and uh, editor and a proofreader on there. And you can buy that book so cool. for, that. Yeah. yeah, you can buy that book for, for a fraction of the price of this. Yeah. But... I think always with Kickstarter and indie developers, um, you have to look at what what are you actually do. Are you just buying a book, or are you trying to make it so that this person can survive as well while still yeah. producing this? And this comes stuff. back to supporting the community, doesn't it? Which we've spoken about before. Um, I think it looks great. Yeah, it's beautiful. And, and when I hear about the contents, I'm I'm, uh, I'm intrigued. Yeah, I mean, if you if you basically went from start to finish in that book, you as a GM, if you ignore the character creation, you go from the beginning of like system creation to the end, you'll have a functional in a role playing sense, um, uh, solar system to play mm. in with your players. Yeah. And to me, that is a lifesaver because I don't have the time to just do it all myself. Yeah, it's really, same I for really me now. I mean, family life, everything. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I think it's a really impressive looking book. Uh, it's not cheap. No. Seems that you get what you paid for, though. Um, yeah. I think if you're a collector, if you consider your books to be art books, which I certainly do, um, you're a particular fan of science fiction role playing games. You run a lot. You're a world builder. Um, at the very least, check out the PDF. Worth also checking out the you know if, if you're not too sure if you if you want this expensive printed version and we'll we'll go back and have a look at that price again in a second. Um, at least check out if what the product has is something that you can use and consider backing it for just a PDF, even if it's just from drive through. Uh, certainly worth taking a look. You can um, get the standard color version for sixty bucks. Yeah. So, you know, you can you can go for that, but I would say with a book of this size, you, you're going to have to worry about that spine, and you are going to be flicking through it a lot RPG. with all the tables. Yeah. So. Yeah. So if you're going to get a, a cover, uh, sorry, a print version, you're better off probably getting the offset. I'm not a huge fan of the printed books that I've gotten from drive through they tend to be glued spines rather than like a proper binding and mm. you certainly notice it after a while initially it's it's generally fine um, but i do think it's better for zines and, and that sort of thing so we are looking at 60 quid uh yeah 80 dollars if you're in the us 110 dollars is an extra 30 dollars to get it over to another country mm. I can there is a pledge probably... level there is a pledge level above that, but it's only for the US where um, I think it's like 150 for worlds without number and stars yes. without number. Yeah. But I, he has said you can buy, he has a limited amount from the last Kickstarter that you can buy direct from him, even if you live outside of the US. So. Okay. But you'd have to go directly no. for that, yeah. I guess. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, not cheap. Looks great. I would be tempted. Uh, I'm not going to back it purely because I'm not finding myself really running science fiction stuff at the moment. So for me, it doesn't have a lot of value. But I could be interested in looking again at Worlds Without Number. I remember talking about that on um, Friday, uh, the Friday fill-in, which was a thing we used to do on um, the Victory Condition Gaming stream. Uh, and I was tempted then. So... Uh, Let's move on to the one that I am very interested in. Another OSR game. Down we go. And this actually I think is really interesting. We've uh, spoken before about uh, various OSR things. And uh, one of the first things that drew me to this when I was scrolling through it, because, you know, I've got things like Mercury and... Uh, some other OSR things. We've got DCC. We ran a DCC game with uh, Judge Zach. We're hoping to get some more DCC on the channel at actual plays uh, in the not too distant future. Um, but we talked about old school essentials and about Diogo Nogueira. And uh, one of the th stretch goals on this project, and I am just scrolling all the way through this. My apologies. Uh, let's see if we can find them was already unlocked <laughs> there we go the museum dungeon by diogo and that immediately caught my eye because he's such a a great creator of this sort of grim dark stuff that it immediately gives you an expectation of what this project's about um but what is it let's have a look shall we Captures the whole the heart of old school tabletop RPG flavor with simple core rules. Includes procedures, adventures, hex crawls, a new setting. Um, it's Swedish designed Marcus Lindrum. Um, so we know it's gonna be good. <laughs> I may be um, biased here, but you know. <laughs> I, I am biased, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> also biased. Now, I mean, I mean, I should point out that Cult was the first role-playing game that I ever wanted. The original, well, second edition it would have been. Mm. And um, obviously, as a 14-year-old boy, 
I was refused that in the UK, so I bought Vampire the Masquerade instead. Um, so I have always appreciated Swedish RPG, even when I didn't realize it. Um, but I really like the style of this. I, th I want to say that this was um, kind of co-designed with Johan Nord as well, but I could be making that up. He, no, he does. He does do some art for it. Um, yeah, he's okay. yeah, he's he's one of the people that's on for the art. Um, and it's also got um, Karl Huenberg, uh, yeah. Skull Fungus, how most people yeah. know. So um, there's some, there's some pretty. I mean, the talent on here. There's, I, I, I'm on the um, the Healer RPG Discord, and there are a lot of indie developers from there that are attached to this. Um, so Jeremy Gage um is on there um you've also got keegan exe um uh ava is on there uh, ava islam um and then you've also got something that mentioned on the show i think it was last week um walton wood from uh ex libris is has been has been brought on as an editor so yeah it, there's a lot of talent on here there's a page about who's involved i think it's right go. yeah it's there so marcus Lindholm. um and you can actually check out a version it. an early version of it on drive through rpg there's an early cool. version i hadn't realized that was there. on there um, um madeline ember she does great stuff um yeah i mean it's just awesome and it, even evelyn moreau which will please andy because uh, Evelyn Moreau was one of the key illustrators for the D Sanction. Ah, uh, I didn't recognize the name, so that's, that's yeah. cool. But yeah, I mean, in terms of the actual product itself, he so says scrolling all the way back up again, there are <laughs> lots of different um, things that you can get. So we say here it's a uh, focuses on player skill and narrative logic while using simple D20 and D6 mechanics. Using a role system, fusing class skill stats into four archetypes for new and experienced players. So um, it's a role playing game. You know, that's what it is. I like that they're offering um, a hardback edition as well as a kind of zine version. I would certainly go the hardback route. Infinite edition, single page of core rules. So they've learned that, you know, from Merc Bori, that no matter how beautiful you make the book, if you can simplify the rules for you know quick play, that's really important. Hmm. That those back two pages in, in Merg Bori are I've got it here, and who hasn't seen it, uh, are so valuable. Mm -hmm. So I mean it was know, it's, uh, it's, one page dungeons also, I think that's yeah, exactly appealing for me. So I mean literally, in fact, it's only this page you need to worry about for. Mm -hmm. For Mert Bori, that's the entirety of the rules. Um, and the rest is like you know, random roll tables. But it doesn't look like it. Mm. Mm. You know, so simple rules, even if there's a lot of art behind it. Definitely appreciated. Uh, what else have we got? Core setting, Infinopolis, expanded gym procedure. So that implies to me, and I don't know, so I'm just interpreting it now that this isn't a game that already exists which ties into what martin was just saying um fulfilling locally in the us canada uk eu and australia that's really good actually yeah. that means you're not going to get any nasty shipping surprises mm. and yeah digital soft cover hard cover with two bonus pages because they have a page limit, I guess, and they already it's know what they're A5, doing. so it's uh, kind so of... It's like uh, board. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, it's very like that. Yeah. I like that. I really like I need more of this. Yeah. Then this book doesn't look stupid on the shelf. <laughs> <laughs> Get Troika, and it won't. Yeah, I keep thinking that I should look at that. Um, so I think I've backed it at the Deep Delver level. Currently. <clears throat> But we're looking Defin at I'll definitely check this one out. I need I really to I need to buy a cassette player. Oh, have you backed it this one? <laughs> <laughs> Naughty boy. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I mean, you know, it comes with two adventures instead of the one. I would probably get it at that 
earlier level, the uh, Deep Nova level, and then just pay the difference for the extra adventures. Um, but you could keep going all yeah. the way up to if you happen to have friends, yeah. whatever they are, <laughs> then you could even go for this level. All right. Yeah, but yeah, Deep Delve no. seems to be a, a good kind of compromise, and then you can just add on a couple of extras if you're not sure what you need. So in, in my case, I'll get that, which comes with one pamphlet, which is the uh, Beneath the Necropolis, and then I'll just add the bog to that. Yeah. Um, and I'm not sure how they're going to handle these other add-ons like this one, whether or not that's going to be an additional yeah. add-on or if they're just going to provide it at a certain pledge level. If that, that's if why it has to be a, the higher one. Just in case, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we should dig into that and find out whether or not that's something extra that we'd mm. need to back. But I don't know that off the top of my head, so that's worth looking at. This is on GameFound um, as opposed to Kickstarter. And... I mean, GameFound is great, as far as I can tell so far. I've used it yeah. for a couple of things. I don't think I've actually had anything fulfilled that I had through GameFound. Um, but it is an alternative crowdfunding platform as well as what it was originally, which was like a, a pledge manager. So they've kind of expanded it out. Yeah. That's what I really like about it, actually. Um, the fact that it's already got that back end, whereas Kickstarter doesn't. All Kickstarter has is the... Um, yeah, fill, fill in a uh, survey. Fill in a shitty survey. Yeah. Yeah. Whereas, like, they've built from a pledge manager to a crowdfunding platform, and that, to me, is like they've already got that back end, which is what a lot of people want when it funds. Um, so you don't need to go to Backer Kit, which I know Phil doesn't. I have much. a hatred of Backer Kit. <laughs> Absolute hatred of Backer Kit because, yeah. unlike GameFound and Pledge Manager back a kit you say what you want to add mm. you give them your card details and then at the point when the person who's running that project closes the the back of kit late pledges whatever the pledge manager that's the point when they charge your card yeah. and unless you are very very good with budgeting or incredibly affluent and i'm neither of these things um it's not very comfortable when you suddenly have a you know 150 quid or even 30 quid let's say it that you weren't really planning to go out of your account goes out you know there've never been any massive consequences for me but it's not really the point you know if you if you don't know when it's going to leave your account it can make things uncomfortable and not everyone in this hobby is uh, particularly minted particularly well off no you know, and it's it's not like it gets any cheaper for us. <laughs> and that's why I like this. Um, that's why I actually really like this um, game um, because you can go in at much lower levels and still get the game out of it for the digital copy. Um, you know, you still and the way they've broken it. I, maybe it's just that it's not Kickstarter. It, it seems to. It I, I seem it? to be able to kind of get around this. Um, this project a lot easier than in Kickstarter. You know, it's got the kind of the menu at the side where you can just jump between all the different things that you need to find. Um, I, yeah, it was just a lot easier to work out exactly what I wanted from it, what it was about, who was involved with it. Um, yeah. And, you know, you can back at a really low level and still get something that looks really good. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it does feel a lot, a lot freer uh, for for doing that and i do think they've done a really good job it's still a little way to go in terms of the you know the uh, product itself for um for game found there are some times when things feel a little bit buggy mm. but overall i think they have done a really good job and i quite like that it, the project then goes from funding as in you know effectively the kickstarter project phase into back a kit and quite a relatively seamless transition there might be a gap in the middle but you're kind of going to the same place. There's no break in it. Yeah, and it, I mean, that's good for late pledges because you handle yeah. them through the same system exactly. instead of having to go to back a kit or whatever. And, you know, I mean, I already had a quick look. Um, I went into categories um, on GameFound 
but because this was the first time I'd ever seen it, I, I've not backed anything yeah. through it before. Um, I, I had a really kind of quick look and I went into the, um, into the categories and found that there was um, another, another game in there that I like, that's just a preview of the game. Yeah. Um, it's, it's not out yet. And I was really interested in it. It just felt a lot easier to get around than Kickstarter. Maybe yeah. it's because there's less on there. Yeah, you know, possibly that as well. Uh, I do find it can get a little bit tricky to navigate when you get more things going on. But what I will say, talking of game found, is that um, I got the PDF of something that was backed a few months ago. And I am going to share that, actually, because I think it's kind of cool. Um, and because, you know, there's nothing quite like forcing people to buy stuff that you think is quite cool. Uh, that's the point so, of this channel, isn't it, for Pretty much, that's how it feels. <laughs> Let's very quickly talk about Vast Grim because I've got the PDF in. Oh, it looks so pretty. It's Mercbury Toothbrush. Radical. Toothbrush. No. <laughs> Toothbrush, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Let's make this page a little bit more yeah. useful. Uh, there we go. That's a little better. So, this is a Mercbury compatible. And I just, I kind of like what they've done with it. Yeah. I know a lot of people aren't loving it, uh, particularly if they're drawing parallels to, uh, I've forgotten the name of it, but the other space, kind of space cowboy game that's recently come out. Someone in the comments will probably remind me. Orbital Blues. Thank you. That's the one, which I didn't back. Um, but this is a different beast, really, as far as I'm concerned. This is this is a kind of punk, you know, sci-fi trash game as opposed to Orbital Blues, which is very much a different feel entirely. And this does scream Mercbury in space to me, mm. even though the, the typesetting is a little bit traditional, which I think is a shame. Oh look, they've 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 twisted it a bit there. It looks a bit Mercbury now. Yeah, that's a bit better. <laughs> there's a lot of traditional typesetting which is just easier quicker to do and let's face it means you can read the damn thing <laughs> so phil which level did you back this at because i was looking at this oh. today when i was looking on oh, game and yeah i am um, a really low level actually not um, not the really cool colored dice level then well, the, uh... that's the level that i originally backed it at and then i right. remembered that i have a responsibility to not be a dick um, so I backed it at the, let me see what it, they called it. They, oh yeah. They literally called it the RPG book and set of dice level 26 okay. pounds currently. Okay. Um, because I kind of realized that all the other levels, all they do is add more dice. And I'm at that point now where I've got a lot of dice Yeah. and you end up only using a small number of them anyway, really. Hmm. But I think this looks fucking great, to be honest with you. Yeah. Um, you know. What do you What do you think of those two, Robbie? Down we go, and this one. Which Which one screams out to you more? Down we go. Yeah. Mm. But But the other one, uh, the last one here, it looks really awesome as well. But you know, mm. I'm a fantasy guy. Uh, yeah. 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 But I would say that Vast Grim is probably the same sized book, mm. and so would look great on the shelf. <laughs> and I think also because um, that's what matters is what matters. And to that end, we Do you must get the kickback from the... this. Or... <laughs> I, fucking wish. I fucking wish. But to that end, actually, it's probably also worthwhile me mentioning that we've got Kinless ending in the next six days. Um, I don't know if I can quickly bring that up. Um, Kinless kicks. I, I did uh, add. Um, game found in the browser so i'm definitely going to check it out yeah i'm i have spoken to chris and it's not impossible that i might be able to uh get chris on the show to discuss kinless uh kinless appears to be a solo or one gm one player viking mercbory mm. and i like that a lot basically um there's some more art that's been added now i like this hardcover it's pretty 
And that's on Kickstarter, right? All right. That's mm -hmm. on Kickstarter. Mm -hmm. Welcome, Robbie, to the We're Going to Spend Your Money for You channel. <laughs> <laughs> um, Kinless, uh, you're looking at, let's face it, the $90 box set. Nice. Um, to get dice, character sheets, player map, bunch of stretch goals, and the hardcover book, which I think looks awesome. But there's also a soft cover paperback or digital, which looks like an app. It's not. They're just representing that you can read a PDF on your phone. No. And there was some kind of kickback from idiots that didn't want to actually learn the project properly. Um, but who, who created this? This was created by a guy called Chris Williams uh, at um, Explore Dungeons. And we've had a look at Explore Dungeons. They've done some really interesting zines for osr games basically and dnd &D. and they put a couple of projects together they're all on drive through rpg uh like uh campaigns for fifth edition and stuff like that or some long scenarios for fifth edition um i want to remember what the uh the big one was that i was looking at for something like tomb of the serpent god or something like that um serpent king maybe um i should have that to hand but i've switched machines i don't have it on this machine to kind of demonstrate it right now but they're really cool actually yeah. if you look at explore dungeons on drive through rpg you can see some of the previous work it's pretty competent i'm also super excited because and i might have that on here actually there was a, a hint at ah hang on I know where to get it. Um, but there's a hint at an upcoming project. Just having to go through my own drive through RPG library, which is not great television, sorry. Hmm. Scene two, there we go. Rise of the Snake God was the scenario I was thinking of. But there is something from Merc Boy, which I think is awesome. Preparing download. Don't we just love drive through RPG sometimes? Refresh that. I would say that um, if people are looking on Game Found, it's worth going down to the bottom on the homepage, and there's a lot of tags on there that you can just click on. There's an RPG one, and it brings up um, live projects ones that are in preview ones that are in late pledge um, yeah and one that i saw which i really like the look of which is in preview is cyber metal 2012 by world champ game co that's by adam vass he's uh he's, he's another one from the healer rpg discord who's <laughs> the creator other discords are available like ours for example yeah if you want to, yes like... go to the dark old discord that's much <laughs> Let me see if I can find it. There was a piece of art in here that made me just laugh my ass off. I can't find it now. There. Look at that. <laughs> Smörkas body. Smörk. <laughs> and my understanding is it's kind of set at a, like a <laughs> Viking feast or something. Yeah. I just thought, yeah, okay. Or does it say smurk horse, boy? It's an horse. Yeah, yeah. there's a, a little circle over here. Smurk horse. Smurk horse board. Yep. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's late in Sweden. Took Robbie yeah. a minute. <laughs> so, yeah, I love it. I think it's great. Awesome. I really do. Um, but yeah, Kinless. Six days left. Check it out if you like Vikings, if you like Mercbori. Um, there are a couple of things, actually, that I was going to talk about, but I think we're pretty much out of time. Um, as we were aiming for originally a one-hour show so that Yoel could join in with Kickstarter. Maybe um, but, you know, <laughs> it never pans out as an hour because we've always got things to talk about. I hope you've enjoyed the show. Uh, if you have, please hit the like and the subscribe and let us know in the comments what you thought of our spotlight on um, Darko Octomono. And if you'd like us to 
do a spotlight on another game. And if you would, give us some ideas of what you think we should cover. Maybe we can find some resource and some brains to actually just discuss those systems and, and you know, pull something interesting together. And go to Redbubble and buy merch. Yes, go to Redbubble, buy merch. <laughs> Link's down there. Join our Discord. Link's down there. <laughs> Robbie's crotch. <laughs> You're Robbie's crotch. Down, down there. <laughs> More importantly as well, thank you to everyone who's watched live. So thank you to Andy, to Jason. Uh, and just scrolling and scrolling and scrolling. I can only see the people who've commented. Yo, obviously. Uh, Sanjuro, I know you joined late. But thank you very much for joining. Um, anyone else that has kept quiet but has been watching, thanks for watching. And anyone who's watched this on Catch Up, again, just let us know what you've enjoyed of the show. We'll be back next week. Uh, we've also got a couple of actual plays coming in coming weeks. Uh, I'm really excited about those, and I can't wait to tell you more about them. Uh, but for now, thank you so much for joining, and uh, I hope that your dice rolls are all way better than mine. Take care, everyone. Thanks again. Bye.